Welcome to Games from Folktales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. Time to return to Kunz's Law of Precious Stones. Lapis Lazuli. Lapis Lazuli is a vibrantly blue, semi-precious stone, but to mythic Europeans, it's terribly rare. First, let me note that when I was a lad, we were all told that the blue material in Egyptian art was lapis lazuli. This is simply not true. The Egyptians did have access to lapis lazuli, it's mined in Sinai, and they did use it for jewellery, but they use it a lot less than I, at least when I started researching this, thought. Imagine, if you will, the mask of King Tutankhamun. The broad horizontal blue stripes in his headdress are not lapis lazuli. There is a tiny amount of lapis lazuli in the mask. It's in the eyes and eyebrows. The other material is, I believe, a sort of fired porcelain coloured with a mineral called Egyptian blue. The Romans called this other material cerealeum, which lets me rope in the discussion of cerulean blue that we had in one of the previous episodes. Unhelpfully, what we now call lapis lazuli, the Imperial Romans called sapphires which leads us to question what biblical sapphires were really made of. The modern name first emerges in the Middle Ages. Ground into a dye, it's been found in European materials from before the game period, but not in great quantity. A century after the game period, it was the most expensive pigment known to Italian artists. Yes, even more expensive than Murex Purple, our old favourite, which we've used over and over again. It's worth more than its weight in gold, The name for the dye, ultramarine, is literal. Italians imported it from over the sea in Asia Minor. There are two reasons why ultramarine is so expensive in the game period. It's only mined in one place in the world, from a mythic European perspective, a small region of what is now northeastern Afghanistan. The second problem is a technical one. Even once the lapis is mined, it needs to be processed to make ultramarine. At the start of the 13th century... Game period. Europeans found a way of grinding lapis lazuli so it doesn't just become a great dust. The process is time-consuming and uses caustics like lye to remove the impurities from the ground stone. Kunz notes, Lapis lazuli, a blue stone with little golden spots, was a cure for melancholy and for quartone fever, an intermittent fever returning each third day or each fourth day, counting in the previous attack. We'll end the quote there. The gold spots were a way of telling what we now call lapis lazuli from what we now call sapphire. The current rules give lapis lazuli keep limbs healthy 5, cure boils and ulcers 5, obsession, power of demons 6, and powdered aphrodisiac 3, but I'm not sure where any of that comes from folkloristically. I'd like to note that I gave the Yarbatans blue and gold robes in Sanctuary of Ice, And that's even more deliberately opulent now that we know that ultramarine and gold are literally the two most expensive things. You could argue that this is a hint that the Yarbatans have some sort of settlement in the Far East. Some of their brethren occasionally head out along the Silk Road. Lodestones. For this stone, I'll be quoting Kunz heavily, but before launching in, I'd like to know that load is an archaic English word meaning to travel. Lodestones are a mineral called magnetite, which is found in several places in mythic Europe. How it gets magnetised is a bit of a puzzle to ancient people. In the modern day, we think it's because of the magnetic fields which surround lightning strikes. I'd note that Switzerland, which is the home of one of the many commercial deposits of magnetite, is also the home of the lightning tradition of House Flambeau. It may be that it assists their magic. In the modern day, magnetite is mined for iron. The objects made from this might have different properties for enchantment, than things made from meteoric, geolithic, or bog iron. I went to university in Townsville, and that's in North Queensland. The island sheltering the harbour is called Magnetic Island because when Captain Cook cruised on by, he noticed it was mucking with his compass. Oddly, the lodestones there are laying in the reverse to what you'd expect. Their magnetic north points toward the geographic south, and this is because when they were laid down, the Earth's poles were in reversed positions to what they are today. I've no proof of similar reversed lodestones in mythic Europe, but I love the idea they can be used as shielding against the Vim field, much as lead can be used to block radiation. Time for some kuns. We have the authority of Plato for the statement that the word magnetis was first applied to lodestone by the tragic poet Euripides, the more usual name being the 
Heraclean stone. These designations refer to two places in Lydia, Magnesia and Heraclea, where the mineral was found. Pliny states on the authority of Nicander that a certain Magnes, a shepherd, discovered the mineral on Mount Ida while pasturing his flock because the nails of his shoes clung to a piece of it. We are told by Pliny that Ptolemy Philadelphus, planning to erect a temple in honour of his sister and wife Arsinoe, called in the aid of Chirocrates, an Alexandrian architect, the latter was engaged to place therein an iron statue of Arsinoe, which should appear to hang in mid-air without support. However, both the Egyptian king and his architect died before the design could be realised. The story of an image held in suspense by means of powerful magnets set in the floor and roof, and sometimes in the walls of the temple, is repeated in a variety of forms by early writers. Of course, there was no real foundation for such tales, as the thing is altogether impracticable. The Roman poet Claudian, the 5th century AD, relates that the priests of a certain temple, in order to offer a dramatic spectacle to the eyes of the worshippers, caused two statues to be executed, one of Mars in iron and another of Venus in lodestone. At a special festival, these statues were placed near to each other and the lodestone drew the iron to itself. There was current, as early as the 4th century, a curious belief that a piece of lodestone, if placed beneath a pillow of a sleeping wife, would act as a touchstone of her virtue. This first appears in the Alexandrian poem Lithica. The same writer attempts an explanation of the popular fancy that powdered lodestone thrown upon the four corners of the house causes the inmates to feel as though the house is falling down. Of this, he says, that seeming is by moving that cometh by turning of the brain. In classical writings, the fascination exercised by a beautiful woman is sometimes likened to the attractive power of the lodestone, as notably by Lucian, who says that if such a woman looks at a man, she draws him to her and leads him with as she will, just as a lodestone draws iron. To the same idea is probably drew the fact that in several languages the name given to the lodestone indicates its peculiar power was conceived to be a manifestation of the sympathy of love of one mineral for another. Just to step out of cons for a moment here, I'd note that he's failing to account for Lucian being a satirist. I believe that Lucian may not be suggesting this seriously, much as he does not seriously suggest in true story that he actually visited the moon. Back to Kunz. A rich growth of Mohammedan legends, remember he's writing in the 19th century, sorry about that people, grew up around the exploits of Alexander the Great. In one of them, it is related that the Greek world conqueror provided his soldiers with lodestones as a defence against the wiles of genies or evil spirits, the lodestone as well as magnetised iron being regarded as a sure defence against enchantments and the machinations of evil spirits. A man in armour graven on a magnet or lodestone has the power to aid in incantations and makes the wearer victorious in war. I think the current rules give shape and material bonuses for magnets as Rigo 2, Rigo Corpus 4, Rigo Terum 4, Animal 3. Clearly, this should be pushed out to travel plus 9. It's literally in the name. Malachite. Malachite's what happens when copper ores weather. For example, I sometimes teach children how to make penny batteries in my library, and this produces a layer of malachite on the coins. I'm fond of it myself because it has a lovely green colour, like the leaves of a mallow plant, which is loosely where it derives its name from. In mythic Europe, the largest deposits of malachite are in Lyon and, I presume, Wales. The Welsh mines were pre-Roman, though, so it might have been exhausted. Malachite is mined to then melt down for copper. Some coins, for some reason not easy to fathom, malachite was considered to be a talisman peculiarly appropriate for children. If a piece of the stone was attached to an infant's cradle, all evil spirits were held aloof and the child slept soundly and peacefully. In some parts of Germany, malachite shared with turquoise the repute of protecting the wearer from danger in falling, and it also gave warning of approaching disaster by breaking into several pieces. This material was well known to the ancient Egyptians, malachite mines having been worked between Suez and Sinai as early as 4000 BC. The appropriate design to be engraved upon malachite was the image of the sun. Such a gem became a powerful talisman and protected the wearer from enchantments, from evil spirits, and from attacks of venomous creatures. The sun as the source of light was generally regarded as the deadly enemy of necromancers, witches, and demons, who delighted in darkness and feared nothing more than the bright light of day. Because of its peculiar markings, some of which suggest the form of an eye, malachite was worn in some parts of Italy as an amulet to protect the wearer from the spell of the evil eye. Such stones were called peacock stones for their resemblance in colour and marking to a peacock tail. 
The form of these Malachite amulets is usually triangular, and they were mounted in silver. It's curious to note, as proof of the persistence of superstitions, that an Etruscan tomb at Chiusi contained a triangular perforated piece of glass, each angle terminating in an eye, formed of glass of various colours. I don't think Malachite is in the current shape and material table, but I'd suggest causing sleep 7, protecting children 6, protection 3. As such, it's particularly suited as a stone to be used for items designed to protect apprentices, either on adventure or when assisting in laboratory work. Your saga may vary.